In this episode we chug energy drinks, we compare boxes, even more boxes, we compare prices, and then we have this thing. Since my previous video on this matter, where I was so impressed with that mini computer from Dell, the Optiplex 3060, I decided to do a follow-up to see once more how much things have evolved in this one liter range of very small computers, almost 4 years later. I ended that video asking if and what AMD might bring to the table, and well, I got my answers. This is gonna be a long intro, so buckle up. As a quick recap, Dell managed to achieve this form factor, MFF as they call it, which stands for micro form factor, because they ditched a slim optical drive and made the power supply external, basically using a laptop one. Furthermore, it uses sodium RAM, which is of course smaller in size than the regular sticks. Dell is not the only player in town regarding these tiny machines, because we have Intel with their Nooks, for example, HP and Lenovo. So let's explore some of these to show you how I narrowed down my options. First of all, we need some ground rules. My price target was around 200 to 300 bucks or pounds. Of course, this is my personal threshold because more than this, I think you are better off with a cheap regular build or mix and match from the secondary market. So value for money is number one here. Second of all, I think these machines are perfect for someone who is always on the move or has to do remote work or just like me, just enjoys a very small machine in a tiny footprint that is also capable and practical, of course, as long as you are happy with the pros and cons. Plus, the main idea behind my channel has always been around smaller machines, so this is right up my alley. As a reference point for this video, I will take the specs and results from that Dell Optiplex, which had an Intel 8th Gen 8500T, which is basically a low power 35 watts, 6 core, 6 threaded CPU, with an integrated graphics, the UHD 630. For me at that time, I was blown away by the fact that I was able to run smoothly at 720p, low settings, Crisis Warhead and even Battlefield 1. Worth mentioning that if you want something like this, just make sure to look at the I.O. because these are customizable from factory, so things may vary. Also the higher number in the model depicts a more capable platform, as in more bandwidth overall. More on this later. Currently, if we look on Dell's website, we have options up to a 13 gen i7 with 16 cores, those mix of uh, high performance and e-cores, 24 threads and a turbo boost up to 4.9 GHz. I mean, these are crazy specs for such a small machine if that CPU doesn't thermal throttle at all. On the GPU side, this will get you an UHD 770, which apparently is on average anywhere between 40 to 50% more theoretical performance over the 630, which is not bad. But again, let's not forget the value because this thing is over a grand at least, so yeah, I think we will come back to these in a few years. Now if you look at Lenovo's page, they have an updated for the 13th gen, but they max out at an i9 12th gen, which looks to be the same as the 13th gen i7. Anyway, but scrolling down, I saw this. NVIDIA discrete GPU. I was what, how, where? Well, apparently even on these one liter machines, you can have a dedicated graphics card. Even Dell did it on the 7080 for example, but they're quite rare. Basically, they use the half height single slot low power GPUs, like the P series and the newer T series now, with the latest one being a T1000. There is even a model that has 8GB of GDDR6 VRAM. All of this under the PCIe slot thermal limits, which is highly impressive. If you're still with me so far, this gives us an insane perspective shift considering again the tiny footprint and the fact that now we are talking about the possibility of upgrading your GPU down the line. Or even to upgrade an older Lenovo machine, like somebody did just that on the Lenovo forum. How powerful is a T1000 you may ask? Well, a rough estimate, it matches a GTX 1650. Again, it all depends on what you compare stuff to, so this one clearly beats any integrated graphics that we have discussed so far. Once more coming back to earth, the prices for the GPU alone, even the 4GB one, are a bit too much to justify it, because you need to add that price to the Lenovo computer as well. If you want to upgrade, let's say an older one, like this P330 that has an i7-8700T. Plus, there is no point in talking about the newer P360s to have one in fully specced form because those prices are way off the charts. Knowing now that at least on paper this possibility exists with a discrete GPU on the Lenovo side, let's see how things are with HP. This is because they took things even further all the way to an RTX 3050, which is mental. Albeit a laptop one, but still pretty decent. But I can't find anything on eBay, YouTube and Google. If anybody has such a unit, please leave a comment since I'm very curious how it is. Right, after all that research, I boiled it down to basically one viable choice within the price range. 
Meet Goliath, or by its official name, a Lenovo M75Q Gen 1 Tiny from the Think Center series. These are very attractive because you can have them with the Ryzen APU with the RX Vega 11 graphics. This one has the Ryzen 5 Pro 3400GE, basically a lower power OM version of the 3400G. It's a quad-core A-threaded CPU with highly respectable base and boost clocks. Also, this was the max configuration you can get from the factory for this generation. The Gen 2 Tinies are available up to a 5000 series APU, but not much improvement has happened in the integrated graphics over the Vega 11. This one I managed to snag it around 160 quid because it had no RAM and storage. Not a problem because 16 gigs of sodium RAM is really cheap, like 20 quid. And then regarding storage, you have the option for an M.2 and a 2.5 inch SATA drive. Now let's talk about some limitations I discovered. First, you are limited to 2666 MHz regarding RAM, despite the fact that the CPU accepts on paper up to 2933. This is always the case with OEM machines that use a custom motherboard and BIOS, because they are intended to be used as a workstation. The other limitation for this generation is 1TB for the M.2, but thankfully it is at full Gen 3 X4 speed and not Gen 3 X2 like I had on the Dell 3060. Then this Gen 1 doesn't have any 10GB USB ports, only 5GB per second, whereas the Dells in the same price range you would have at least a couple of the faster ones, albeit those are on the Intel platform. Then the final and most important one is the stock power supply. Most of them will come with a 65W unit and there is a lot of proof online that suggests that this is not enough and it will greatly impact the performance. They recommend you get the 90W or even the 135W one. On the flip side, these use the laptop square plug power supply, so you can pretty much use whatever you want from Lenovo. I was lucky since mine came with a 90 watt power unit, and as far as I'm aware, this is valid just for this particular generation and model. I don't know if the Gen 2s will benefit from a higher power supply, for example. Now to the good parts. Build quality is excellent, all metal panels and great serviceability, even greater than Dell's. I mean, for those to access the RAM, you have to take out the CPU cooler shroud, whereas Lenovo has put them and the M.2 storage units on the back underneath this tray. So on the front, you have the power button with an LED, hard drive activity light, microphone and headphone jack, one type C and one type A USB ports, both 5 GB per second. The regular USB port also supports always on function, which means it will charge any device while the computer is off. Then a cool detail that Lenovo does with its machines, the dot on the eye in Think lights up when the PC is on. Then on the back you get a fully sized display port and HDMI, one 5GB per second USB, followed by three regular USB 2.0. Zooming in on this USB port, we notice that it has the keyboard logo, which implies that this PC can be turned on by a peripheral. The final item on this section is the Wi-Fi, which can be had with or without an antenna. Up top there is another display port, which is an optional extra, again how the main buyers pre-configure them on the website. The other options were stuff like HDMI, serial port Type-C, etc. To open it, it's identical to the Dell units, just unscrew this bolt and then slide the cover forwards. Inside we have basically the same layout as in a Dell, a socketed CPU with a blower type fan. The other empty half is for the 2.5 inch drive, also a toolless design. Also as in the Dells, they have a front internal speaker, but I found it to be way less powerful than in the Dells. That is an intrusion alert switch and the red LED is for the letter I. The fan is made by Delta and it's a brushless type bearing. The more powerful CPUs on the Intel side possess a more beefed up cooling design with a hydraulic fan and more copper on the heatsink. Then some order models will have an extra heatsink array that will cool the discrete graphics card, or some of them will use their own GPU fan. The SSD tray is toolless, but I don't like how they made the connection here from the regular SATA to that miniature proprietary plug. On Dell this is fixed and soldered directly, so way more resilient in the long run. That's the Wi-Fi adapter and it's replaceable. Now on the back, here is the main M.2 port and this generation only supports one drive, the extra space is for the higher tier models that will support two M.2s. Coming back to the RAM limitation, I'm using an Integra RAM kit at 16GB, clocked at 32MHz with CL22 timings, but if you remember the CPU-Z info, the BIOS downclocked it to 2666MHz despite the fact that these kits are rated for 1.2V as per Lenovo's request. Some say that if you can find the JDEC exclusive kit with 3200MHz at 1.2V, they might work at full speed, like the Kingston Fury Impacts, or I think I need to do a BIOS update, 
but for now the idea is play it safe and don't get higher than 2666, just focus on lower timings. Whatever you do, don't go lower than 16GB because these small systems are highly dependent on RAM, especially in dual channel mode. To get to the CPU it's very easy to remove the fan assembly, just unplug the speaker and vent plugs. That's the CPU underneath there and that's an interesting design for the heatsink with that diagonal profile. Also here we have the BIOS battery underneath this protective cover. That pretty much covers the main bits and let's finally test it. Here is the memory benchmark from ADA64 and the run in Cinebench R23. Nothing spectacular to see which is understandable given its low TDP. However a more important test is the noise output. Given their tiny footprint this can be placed virtually anywhere from the back of your monitor, underneath the desk etc. Now here is the fan at max RPM when you boot it up. You'll definitely hear it if it's right next to you in full load, but for normal everyday use the fan is pretty much dead silent. I'm very happy with the noise optimization Lenovo did here. Temperature wise, low 70s are expected in full load as seen here in Cinebench and that figure is absolutely perfect considering who knows when the thermal paste was changed. I will do that in the future but I wanted to test it as it came. The CPU is very snappy thanks to that higher base and boost clocks. And I mean I used to have the Ryzen 3 3100 and it feels at least to my workflow kinda the same. Now let's jump to the part you all been waiting for, play some games to finally see what the Vega 11 can do. This is Doom Eternal on 1080p on high settings with dynamic scaling. The fact alone that I can play it on 1080p is a miracle for me even at 30fps with some dips. I'm specifically doing this with higher details for 30fps as a target, just to prove a point considering that on the UHD 630 I barely manage 720p with everything on low quality. Also dropping this to 900p or 720p with medium details will make you reach 60fps if you really wanna do this on this computer, which is again another win. And then the other game I tested back then was Battlefield, just so we can see the progress. And just for a giggle I put it on 1080p on Ultra and it worked without crashing. I mean what the heck, alas 1080p on low is the best option here for a smooth frame rate considering again that on the UHD 630 720p on low was the only option. Suffice to say I got my answers, the gains are real as per any generational leap, but this is more rewarding to discover because we are talking about integrated graphics. So you can imagine this is perfect for CSGO, PUBG, Overwatch, GTA 5, etc, even 1080p with a mix of medium to high details, despite the fact that this is not meant for gaming per se. Well ok Alex, how about if you want more GPU horsepower without compromising the form factor or selling a kidney I hear you say. See you in the next video then.